too often we're still leading with the old model of leadership, more the command and control version, but it's not as relevant for this new world of work, which I believe requires a new kind of leadership. And I call that trust and inspire in contrast to command and control. This is Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Good to be with you on another edition of the world's leading transit executive podcast, Transit Unplugged in depth this week with my very special guest and a personal hero, Stephen M. R. Covey. Stephen, thank you so much for being our guest today on the program. Oh, thank you, Paul. I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you today. That's wonderful. I'd, we've never done this before. In six years, we've primarily only hosted public transportation executives, but uh-huh. this year we started a new emphasis on leadership development, Stephen, and you're one of the top leadership development guys in the world. As a matter of fact, you're in New York Times and Number one Wall Street Journal bestselling author of the recent book, The Speed of Trust, which I have here uh, and uh, which I've had in my library for a while. It's been translated in 22 languages and has sold over 2 million copies worldwide. Stephen is also the author of the newly released Wall Street Journal bestseller, Trust and Inspire, How Truly Great Leaders Unleash Greatness in Others, which was just named the number one leadership book of the year by the Outstanding Work of Literature Awards. Hey, congratulations, Stevie. That's pretty awesome. Oh, thanks. No, I'm really happy about that. Yeah, I bet. Um, Stephen also brings to his writings the the perspective of a practitioner. He's the former president and CEO of the Covey Leadership Center, where he increased shareholder value by 67 times. We could take a lesson from that in our company, Stephen, and grew (laughs) the company to become the largest leadership development firm in the world. Wow. A Harvard MBA, Stephen co-founded and currently leads Franklin Covey's Global Speed of Trust Practice. He serves on numerous boards, including the Government Leadership Advisory Council, and he's been recognized with the Lifetime Achievement Award for Top Thought Leaders in Trust from the advocacy group Trust Across America, Trust Around the World. Stephen is a highly sought after international speaker who has taught trust and leadership in 57 countries to business, government, military, education, healthcare, and NGO entities. And again, welcome, Stephen. Thank you for being here today. I can't wait to unpack all that we're going to talk about. Thanks so much, Paul. I'm delighted to be with you and and Transit Unplugged. This is going to be exciting. Yeah, we were just talking in the green room beforehand that as the date of this recording, you had just gotten back from the Super Bowl. Tell us about that and why you were there. Yeah, it was exciting. Well, my my son, uh, Britton Covey, he's actually the uh, starting punt returner for the Philadelphia Eagles. And so we went, we took the whole family to the game, you know, the Eagles and the Chiefs and and uh, the Chiefs won. <laughs> So I was, we were disappointed in the outcome of the game for us because we were Eagles fans, of course. And, uh, but my son did get a play and, uh, and he had two putt returns and, and one was a pretty nice one, a 27 yard return. So yeah, that looked we were excited. Man. Yeah. We were he excited. did awesome. Yeah. Cause it was the big, kind of the biggest stage That's with right. all this attention and everything. And, and he got an opportunity, he got to play. I mean, what's, you know, you, this is almost un- unimaginable that yeah. you can have that kind of opportunity. And he's just a rookie. So wow. that was exciting. Yeah, the biggest stage in the world. And he, he was questionable, right? Right up until the game time? Right up until an hour before the game time because he had hurt his hamstring. He had tweaked it. And, and you know, that's a serious injury if you can't run. <laughs> yeah, if you're a punt returner, yeah. <laughs> and and so they uh, they were waiting until warm-ups to determine okay. if he could go. And um, and he was able to to go and and not only not only did he go, but he you know got a couple of plays, yeah. one which was pretty big. So very that's exciting. Awesome. Yes. So that's your uh, progeny, your child. And now I want uh-huh. to talk a little bit about your dad. Uh, your dad, Stephen Covey, um, is uh, is one of my personal heroes. Uh, of course, most people have heard about him through his book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. But he wrote a bunch of other books, and I followed a lot of what he did earlier in my career, and used and have continued to use those seven habits and other things in, in a lot of the teaching and talking that I do. Tell us about your family growing up uh, in that family. You know, it was, uh, it was amazing as I look back on it now. At the time when I was a young kid, I didn't fully appreciate what I had, yeah. but I, did, I sure did later. And, and, uh, but I remember my dad was, you know, he was working at the time on the seven habits when, when we were kids growing up. Yeah. But he'd yet to publish the book. But we would learn these principles kind of in the home, just one at a time. This is before he'd put them together as seven habits. But I remember, you know, learning the principle of being proactive right. and taking responsibility and not being reactive and, and uh, 
and you know just the whole idea of of in between what happens to you the stimulus and your response to it there's a space and you can choose your response and and being taught that my whole life i remember uh, other important habits like uh, beginning with the end in mind always having a a, a real plan for what you're doing and, a, and an objective of why you were doing it i remember other habits like seek first to understand then to be understood he would teach that that the key to influence with people is to first be influenced by them through genuine empathic listening where they felt understood and so i kind of grew up and, and all of us kids did yeah, there were nine of us we had a big family we kind of grew up hearing these principles being taught them in our home and uh without the full appreciation for the nuggets of wisdom we were we are being given because it was kind of like this is our dad right you know, right. And, you know yeah. and but over time is is as the years passed, we began to realize, hey, we had a pretty amazing dad. And, I, and I'm going to add, and mom, that was yes. she was she was my dad's equal. And uh, we were taught a lot of important things. And so we'd like to see ourselves as we were the guinea pigs for my dad's first uh, ideas. He tested them with us first. And then we realized kind of later how how impactful they were. But I kind of grew up with that. And and um, even with me personally, the the story my dad tells in Seven Habits of Green and Clean, where he taught his son how to take care of the lawn, the yard. Yes. <laughs> that story was about me. That was you, I, huh? I was that young boy. And wow. It's, it's in a story of, of empowerment and of delegation and of being trusted, really, to take responsibility. And, and at first, I kind of didn't follow through. But then I ultimately kind of began to see myself differently. That my, my dad trusted me. And I wanted to live up to it. And I responded to it and rose to the occasion and took care of our lawn. And it was green and it was clean. <laughs> and uh, so I, I kind of use that story even now with the work that I talk about on trust, how I learned this really as a young seven-year-old boy from my dad. That's something. How many copies do you know did that book end up selling? I know it's still a bestseller. It's still a bestseller. It sold over 40 million copies. Wow. And But the interesting thing is I looked just last week. Um, it was number three on the business bestseller list. This is 34 <laughs> years yes. after its publication. It's amazing. So it continues to sell. And I think it's because it's focused on on universal principles. They're not fads. They're not just techniques right. or, you know, or practices alone that will kind of come and go. But they're principles, enduring principles of human effectiveness um, that work anywhere, in any context, in any situation, any culture. And because of that, I think it's had staying power. Yeah. So how did you become an author? How and when? And uh, tell me about your your bestseller, The Speed of Trust, that did, has done so well. Yeah, well, I've kind of had two halves of my career. The first half, I was on the business side. Okay. That's when I ran the business, the Covey Leadership Center, and built it to become global and kind of fi figured out a business model that would work. We always had a great mission to do good in the work, you know, in the world through through uh, seven habits and principle center leadership, but we had to figure out how to turn it into a business. And so yes. I kind of prided myself on that. And, and, but it was after doing that and, and succeeding with the company, then we merged our company, Covey Leadership Center. We merged with Franklin Quest to form Franklin Covey. And we had been arts competitors, Paul, the two companies. And, and so now we're combined and, and there was kind of lower trust to begin mm, with, not because, not because we'd done things to each other. We hadn't. It's just that we'd come at, we'd been at each other's throats in the marketplace. Right. right. For years and competing. Now we're combined. And at first we didn't fully trust each other. And initially the merger kind of struggled at first. It kind of slowly came together because there was a lack of trust. And, and so we were not very innovative, not very collaborative. We became internally referenced instead of focusing on the customer. And we saw firsthand the high cost of low trust. But then we became aware that we need to practice our own content and you know live these values right. and 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 really focus on building trust intentionally. And so we began to work on that and to build the trust on the team in the organization. And we did. We moved the needle on trust through our behavior. We behaved our way into greater trust. And as we did that, then we became far more collaborative, far more innovative, and far more um, effective. And and uh, we focus on the customer better. We began to really succeed. And it was kind of coming out of that whole experience, I realized, my goodness, trust changes everything. 
because I've seen what happens when there's low trust, how everything takes longer, costs more, and it's like a tax put on the organization and, you know, a wasted tax, not a useful one, but a wasted tax. Then I also saw the reverse, how when we built the trust, how that changed everything. Now we can move fast, lower cost, greater creativity, greater innovation, commitment, passion, innovation, all these things were happening. And that really was a dividend, a high trust dividend. So I came out of that saying, trust matters. You can move it. You can go from low to high. And it's really a learnable skill for each of us. We can behave our way into trust just like we can behave our way out of it. And I said, I need to write about this. I need to talk about this because at one level, we all, we all kind of know that trust matters. But at another level, we don't see practically how profound its impact is and also how tangible and practical and learnable trust is. And I felt like I could really make a contribution in both fronts. First, that there's an extraordinarily compelling case for why trust matters. And secondly, that trust is a learnable skill for each of us as leaders, for a team, for an organization, how you can build trust on purpose and turn it into your greatest strength. And so that's from that came the Speed of Trust book, my first book, which is all, all about how people and leaders and, and organizations can really build a high trust team, a high trust culture as a means of better performing their missions and, and you know, their purpose, what they're all about. And uh, so that emerged kind of out of the crucible of that merger where we were struggling at first, and then we turned it around through trust. And I, and I said, this is a message that everyone needs to not only hear, but to really practice and to get good at. And that was the idea behind the speed of trust. That's great. And now your latest book, Trust and Inspire, is it build on that? Is that, it's, it's kind of building on the principles, right? It does. It builds upon those principles. It's also standalone. And the premise of Trust and Inspire it's more of a leadership approach, which is saying this, that the world has changed and is changing all around us, you know, with, with the new generations, the younger generations, Gen Z, millennials, with the idea of work from home, work from anywhere, remote right. work, hybrid work, intentionally flexible work, also with, with technology, with change and disruption, disruptive technologies, all these changes hitting us with so many choices and options. So the world has changed. And our style of leadership needs to keep pace with this changed world. And too often, we're still leading with the old model of leadership, more the command and control version that just has become a better version of it, a more sophisticated, more advanced, I call it enlightened command and control. But, it, but it's not as relevant for this new world of work, which I believe requires a new, new kind of leadership. And I call that trust and inspire in contrast to command and control. And that's a better way to achieve collaboration, a better way to achieve innovation so we stay relevant in this changing, disruptive world. But also, it's a better way to build a kind of culture, a high-trust culture that inspires so we can attract and retain and engage and inspire the best people and bring out the best in people and win that war for talent, which has never been more important than today. And so that's the idea is that in a new world of work, we need a new way to lead. Command and control doesn't work very well anymore. Trust and Inspire does. That's the idea. So it's a leadership book talking about the kind of leadership that is relevant in a new world of work. It's wonderful. I know people, if they get a copy of the book, Trust and Inspire, uh, they can unpack it all. But can you give us a few of the key maxims right now from the book? We'll continue with Paul's interview with Stephen M. R. Covey in just a moment. But first, Mike Bismeyer and Mike's Minute. Hi, this is Mike Bismeyer, Kindness and Transit Advocate, and this is Mike's Minute, where we talk about leadership, mentorship, and kindness with the hopes it'll inspire you to pay it forward. This week's amazing guest, Stephen M. Arconi, was truly inspiring. He referenced trust as one of the main tools of leadership. Trust is important in all aspects of life and how we carry ourselves. Work, life, and every relationship we partake in, trust is the underlying factor. When you lead folks, they need to trust you. They need to know they have their, your support to take the next step, make that decision, and trusting you to be there to back them, regardless of the outcome. The high cost of low trust. I love that term. We have all seen it in every workspace. And as workplace retention and recruiting continue to be a challenge, trust is also an underlying factor in every decision there. As the employer, trusting you have the right people in the right position and allowing them to prosper in that role. As the employee, being able to entrust your employer, understanding their vision, being aligned with it, and having them be honest with you if the vision may be changing. More importantly, always being comfortable in your role and trusting your leader, 
who will inspire you to both move forward with the goals and continue to grow and excel in your own professional development. Trust also directly aligns with mentorship and kindness. People collaborate alongside mentors and leaders because they trust their vision, their ethics, and their experience and want to emulate those skill sets. They're inspired to continue to grow in their own personal toolkits. And when it comes to kindness, trusting yourself, the cause, and the belief that you can create change is not only inspiring, but fulfilling. Trust me in saying that every time you commit a random act of kindness, it's not only impactful to those who may be in need or benefiting, but it's also impactful to you, impactful to your growth, and it's impactful to those around you that have marked you as a leader. Thanks for listening. Thanks for doing what you do. Kindness is cool. Can you give us a few of the key maxims right now from the book? Yes, here's one. People don't want to be managed. People want to be led. They want to be trusted. They want to be inspired. And there's nothing wrong with management. Management's a good thing with things. Mm. But with people, with people, we want leadership. So manage things, lead people. And you know, management again is good. So we good, need good management of things, of technologies, of strategies, of infrastructures, of assets, of schedules, you know, in the transit business, of of uh, the transportation modalities and the different um, assets that we have to achieve that and the schedules and the technologies and the inventories and the, the finances. We manage things, but we lead people. But sometimes we get so good at managing things that we start to treat people as if they were things. Mm. And when we start to manage people like things, then at some point we're going to end up with no people and a lot of things because <laughs> they're going to leave and go elsewhere to where they feel they're trusted and, and, and are inspired. Yes. So it's not good and bad. It's not either or. It's just context. And it's and, you know, manage yes. things, lead people. Be efficient with things. Be effective with people. So you can be command and control with things, but be trust and inspire with people. It's a better way to lead in a new world of work. Absolutely. So I would say that's one maxim. I'll give you another one. Okay. Is people don't want to merely be motivated. People want to be inspired. Now, nothing's wrong with motivation. It's a good thing, but it can only go so far. And so motivation is external, extrinsic. It's outside of us, you know, kind of carrot and stick and rewards. And again, is there anything wrong with rewards? No. Do they work? Sure. They motivate people to want to get more rewards, but you got to constantly put more external stimuli out there. To, to kind of move people. Trust and inspire by contrast is internal. It's intrinsic. It's inside of people. So you light the fire within. And that fire, when lit, that can burn on for months, maybe even years without the need for constant new external stimuli. And, and you know, it's inside of people. You see that. You breathe life into people, into relationships, into teams, into cultures, whereas command and control often sucks the life out of. And so it's another level that we can achieve. And if people were just economic beings only, if all that mattered was money and only money, then motivation would be sufficient. That's, that's the body. But people are not just a body. They're also a heart and a mind and a spirit. So yes, they want to be paid and paid fairly, but they also want to connect you know, through the heart and, and, and be able to have relationships and be able to be part of a team and to belong. And they also want to grow and to develop and to use their mind and their talents and their skills and to add value that way. And they also want to, they have a spirit, so they want to contribute, to make a difference, to matter. Body, heart, mind, spirit, not just body only. So motivation by itself is, is just necessary, but insufficient. We can move to inspiration and to tap into the, what's inside of people, to breathe life into that. And that's what really is going to bring out the best in people. And so that's another level of where, and that's where I believe where leadership is going, Paul. Leadership is going towards inspiration. Mm. Like the way, you remember Wayne Gretzky, the great hockey player? Yes. And, and he, he was asked, what makes you so good at hockey? And he said, I skate to where the puck is going to be. Mm. Not to where it's been, but where, where it's going to be. And I think in leadership, where things are going, where the puck is going, is towards inspiration. Because to be inspired mm. is even a higher level than just to be engaged. And that's been good. Engagement is good. We've been focusing on engagement for the last 20 years. That's a good thing. But there's even something greater. That's inspiration. 
but the road to inspiration goes through engagement. So we, we can stay working on that. But to inspire someone, the study from Bain shows that they're even 56% more productive as an inspired employee than they are as an engaged employee. There's something beyond engagement. It's inspiration. And so that's the idea that people don't want to merely be motivated. They want to be inspired. And that's where we're going with leadership. Very powerful, Stephen. Thank you for sharing that. Let me flip it briefly to our personal lives. You know, most of us working at home more over the last few years during the pandemic, a lot of people have been re-engaged, so to speak, with their family. Uh, You know, I know for seven years I worked, you know, I left the house at seven in the morning, got home at seven at night. My wife basically raised our last two children because I was working, you know, running a big transit system in Baltimore and helping in D.C. Uh, But during that time, now that we've kind of focused being back on our relationships, a lot of folks have realized, oh, there's a lot of work I need to do to repair some of these relationships, some of the trust that has been broken over time. Stephen, I remember I had a good friend one time who was telling me how great his life was. He had just put in a hot tub and, you know, his wife and him were uh, finally, you know, at the end of the day, they could sit in there and have a drink together. And within six months, I found out that he found out that his wife was cheating on him. And the whole thing fell apart. They had to sell the house. His relationship with his daughters has been ruined and they were divorced. And people's lives are in turmoil uh, oftentimes because of a lack of trust. Can you speak to that some? Yes, I think that for all my work on trust inside of organizations and teams, which is critical, it's foundational. I think the greatest place that this has, you know, trust has the, the greatest impact, the most powerful impact is in relationships, including personal relationships with those of the the people that we love and value the most in our lives, our family and friends and and so forth. And that the, the, the most productive relationships, the longest enduring relationships, and really the happiest relationships are those in which people can trust each other. And so to focus at, you know, at the personal level, starting with yourself, because I think that all trust starts with self-trust. Because mm-hmm. think about it. If you don't trust yourself, it's hard to build trust with others because at some point you would project that distrust of yourself out onto others. So always start by looking in the mirror and you know, asking the question, do I trust myself? And do I give to my team a leader they can trust? Do I give to my partner, to my children, to my neighbors, a neighbor, a partner, a, a spouse that they can trust? So that you start with yourself modeling this and then you ripple out to those relationships one-on-one and you focus there building relationships of trust. And that's where the greatest joy and happiness in life comes. A study from Hellowell and Huang shows this, that the number one predictor of happiness, even more than income, even more than health, is relationships of trust. Mm. And so if you start with your own home and family and community and those around you, I think it's a great starting place. And none of us are perfect, but we're always kind of working, trying to behave our way into greater trust, trying to demonstrate care and concern for others and their well-being and and to be really helpful and add value and and such. But then also you can take it to work on your in your relationships one on one there and on your team and let that ripple out from there to the teams that your team interacts with. And then you ripple out through the through a department or a division and then throughout the entire entity. So you can really impact but you do it from the inside out. And that means you look in the mirror and you start with yourself. And so often when it comes to trust, people kind of go outside in they, and they say things like, well, as soon as he changes, then we can build trust around here. Or as soon as she changes, as soon as they change, you know, they're, they're kind of pointing the finger to everybody else. Yeah. And, and saying they need to change. But inside out is saying, I look in the mirror and I say, do I trust myself? And do I give to my team a leader who they can trust? to my family, a a family member they can trust. And I ripple out from there. And so I think that that, that those are our most important relationships. And and starting there, really starting with ourselves and then rippling out like like a ripple effect metaphor where the drop of water comes down, the ripples, the waves, they start at the inside and they ripple out. I think that's the best starting place for each of us as it relates to trust. Self trust precedes relationship trust, which precedes team trust, family trust, which precedes organizational trust, which precedes market or stakeholder trust, which precedes societal trust. So it's inside out, not outside in. And, and, uh, and yet the tendency when it comes to trust is to think outside in. 
so many times I, I'll do a little session, a seminar or a workshop, and I'll have people come up to me and say, Stephen, this is really good stuff you're talking about, but it's just too bad that the person who really needs to hear this, <laughs> you know, my boss yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. or our CEO or this person or that person or my spouse or my kids, that they're not here because they need this. Yeah. <laughs> and they might be right, but the best way we're going to help them get it is to model it, is That's to go right. first. That's the, the idea. Yeah. Start where you actually can make a difference. It's your own life. Great stuff, Stephen. I wish we could talk for a lot longer, but our time's almost out. But I do have one final question for you. And that is, uh, what would you, as I mentioned to you earlier in the green room, a lot of folks who listen to the podcast are mid-level management, want to move up into executive management, or maybe they're already an executive and they want to move toward that you know, CEO or COO job. What's the single best suggestion you could give for someone who wants to move up the ladder of success at their work, at their work? I would say this, and, and this is what I put in this new book, Trust and Inspire, because, you know, about becoming this kind of leader, Trust and Inspire leader, yes. that there's three stewardships that are part of this. You model, you trust, and you inspire. Modeling, trusting, inspiring. Modeling is who we are. Trusting is how we lead. And inspiring is connecting to why it matters. So you inspire when you connect with people through caring and belonging and then connect people to purpose. And then when we extend trust to people, when we're trusting of them, that is what ignites their potential, their talent inside of them. So trusting and inspiring are vital. But in terms of the one piece of advice, I would come right back to modeling mm -hmm. and say this, as a leader, go first. Someone needs to go first. Leaders go first. So if you want more openness and transparency on your team or in the company or in the culture, then you go first in being open and being transparent. You model that behavior. If you want to see more respect and more inclusion and more a sense of belonging, then you as a leader, be the first to show that respect, to be inclusive, to create that sense of belonging. If you want to see if you want more empathy and more um, understanding, then you be the first to be empathic and to listen and to understand. And then finally, if you want more trust and feel like that is needed to be there, then you be the first to give trust, to extend it. Because when you give it, people receive it and they return it. When you withhold it, they withhold it. So yes, there's a lot of things we need. And it's very easy, again, to kind of wait for everybody else and to point the finger out there and look out the window and say, They've got to change. They've got to do this. And that's all true. They ultimately need to. But the way that will help bring it about is to model it. Go first. Someone needs to go first. Leaders go first. And if you can do that as a leader, you'll find that people will look to that. And, and they'll, they'll say, aha, look at what Paul is doing. Look at what Susan is doing. They'll, they'll see a leader that is getting results, but they're doing it in a way that grows the trust on the team, grows the relationships grows the culture, develops the people. And then the quality of those results is better because they have more ability to get to do more of that in the future because they're modeling it. They're going first. And so that would be my number one take-home suggestion is don't wait on anyone else. Lead out in modeling. Go first as a leader of everything that you want to see and everything that you want to do. And you know, be that leader that gets results in a way that inspires trust. And then, then you are serving as a model to others. And as a model, you can become a mentor. A mentor is a model with a relationship and you can help others do the same. And people will start to look at you. And then I think you'll get opportunities in your career and in your life to, to uh, continue to be that model in new situations, new contexts, and so, and so forth. So, but someone needs to go first. The leader goes first. That would be my main advice for people. Great advice. Wow. Powerful. Stephen Covey, thank you so much for sharing with us some principles from your new bestseller, Trust and Inspire. I encourage our listeners to grab a copy for yourselves. I really appreciate, by the way, the personally inscribed one you sent to me. It means a lot to me, and I will, uh, I will hold it dear for, for quite a while. Thank you so much for being our guest today, Stephen, and sharing with our listeners around the world how they can trust and inspire and move up in leadership. Oh, thank you, Paul. It's a delight and honor to be with you. I've worked a lot with uh, uh, public transportation entities and tra public transit authorities and organizations. You do important work. It's meaningful for societies, for communities, makes a difference. And I love that this Transit Unplugged 
podcast is both about the industry, but also about leadership within the industry so that we can have even a greater impact. And that that's what you're doing. So I admire you and the work that you're doing, Paul, with Transit Unplugged to help bring about an even greater transit world that, that we're all involved in that impacts everyone. So thank you. What an honor to be with you and with our guest today. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for listening to this special episode of Transit Unplugged In-Depth with our guest, Stephen M. R. Covey. Now, coming up next week on Transit Unplugged News and Views, our newsmaker interview will be with John Nucci, Deputy Director, Department of Transportation Services for the City and County of Honolulu in Hawaii. And our leadership segment will be Keith Griffin of Lion's Guide. Now, in the meantime, we hope that you'll visit transitunplugged.com to sign up for the newsletter so you're always in the loop with whatever's going on with the show. If you have a question, comment, or like to be a guest on the show, feel free to email us at info at transitunplugged.com. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy. We hope you're enjoying this episode of Transit Unplugged, the podcast. How would you like to see behind the scenes footage of the agencies that Paul visits? Then be sure to check out the new Transit Unplugged TV on YouTube, where transit evangelist Paul Comfort dives into the culture, the food, and the transit of major cities around the world. You'll see the operations control centers, how maintenance shops work, and the latest innovations taking place at agencies around the globe as we work together to improve the lives of our transit riders and our communities. Be sure to subscribe to Transit Unplugged TV on YouTube or at transitunplugged.com.